five, four, three, two, one. Hello, everybody. I'm Dear Myrtle, your friend in genealogy, and Mr. Mert and I are going out for dinner, and uh, so I'm just talking through the extra microphone at my um, workstation here. I'd like to introduce my very distant cousin, Fräulein Schmidt, who will be hosting to this evening as we discuss Swedish Lutheran records that are found at my heritage in digital format. And so, Fräulein Schmidt, take it away. Well, good evening, everyone. I see that we are um, have all our ducks in a row. Uh, Cousin Russ, I forgot to share the link. Uh, you know how dear Myrtle is. She gets so excited on these evenings that she can take off and uh, leave the leave the the rest of us at the helm. Uh, let me share that link so that we can have a few people join us if they wish to on the panel. Thank you. While you're, do, while you're doing that, we have a comment coming in from the Already? community from down under. Laura says, yes. me, Swedish descended Dutch. I'm sorry, I'm going to miss that word. So, Burger. <laughs> so you could Swedish read it. Swedish descendant Dutch burger. Yes, burger. Very good. All right, and did you? And Laura is from Australia. We have a couple of other people viewing us at the moment, and let me talk to you a little bit about this gentleman um, who has joined us on the panel. Uh, this is Jason Oler. He is from my heritage, but if you've been following his dance card of late, you'll see that previously he worked uh, with special projects and was a, a managing partner relationships at Family Search. And you will then see that before that he worked for seven years uh, managing and producing index content over at Ancestry.com. You know, Cousin Russ, we got to have a dance card to keep track of who's who and where's where. You bet. <laughs> OK, but it's all good. So let me put the camera on you, Jason. Um, and you might want to unmute your mic for a bit so that we can talk to you a little bit. Oh, you really don't want to put that camera on this. <laughs> well, it's all about building trust because people then can become familiar with who you are. I understand that you demonstrated Swedish Lutheran records to Dear Myrtle when you all met at NGS, the National Genealogical Society Conference, uh, this past May. This is still the same month of May. Um, and uh, she was quite taken with what you have to offer at oh, my you're heritage. very kind. <laughs> very kind. <laughs> well, yeah, no, it, it's a really exciting offering that we have that we just managed to publish in the past few months. I was excited to share it. Well, and I think that uh, folks who are not familiar with my heritage, you might want to start sharing your screen for a second, Jason. Sure, uh, we'll we get the camera back over to you in a minute. My heritage principally was known throughout the rest of the world other than the United States. They've been doing some re work recently um, on man on the street kind of things with the instant discoveries in Norway in Oslo. Um, but in the past few years since the 1940 census came out, my heritage has made a big push to try to capture those who have uh, who live in the United States or in this US market so to speak but before too long we will find as we're doing our ancestral research that you've got ancestors perhaps in Sweden. Mr. Mert, I understand, of course, now they're out of cell phone range. They turn their cell phone off when they go to dinner on wacky Wednesday evenings. But he has Swedish ancestors. Um, and so this record group is going to be very interesting. Oh, good, Jason. I see that we've got a comment from the community. And then we'll switch over and look at your MyHeritage screen. Anna Matthew says, my parental grandmother's parents immigrated from Sweden in the late 1880s. So that's an interesting migration pattern. Anna, perhaps you can give us some more feedback as to where they ended up settling in the 1880s. Quite interesting. Oh. You know, an, an interesting piece of that, I mean, all throughout Sweden from about 1850s to early 1900s, Sweden lost about 1% of their population per year to immigration. Oh, my. It, there were mass immigrations around that period of time. So her, her relatives were not alone. 
Wow. So they probably came with people they knew, friends, neighbors, and associates. Um, do you have a little PowerPoint you'd like to run before we get into the actual Swedish record? Sure. You, let me just pull this up here. Tell me okay. if you can see it there if I'm lucky. You'll, you'll do just fine. Uh, by the way, folks, um, this just goes to show you that it doesn't take very long to figure out how to use Google Hangouts or Hangouts on Air. The on air ones record automatically on YouTube. But I see that Jason has pulled up a brief PowerPoint uh, to show us uh, or get us oriented to these examination books. And uh, let's talk about it. Show us what you've got. Absolutely. So just a little background on these household examination books. I mean, it, it, to start with, these were examination books where the parish priests, starting in, 18, or in 1684, uh, were directed to go to every household within their parish and uh, test the inhabitants on their knowledge of the catechism. So this started in 1684, but was not completely and widely established until around 1715. Uh, these books are available for viewing through 1945, and, and even and through 1991, they're used as the de facto census from year to year. Uh, You've got to be kidding me. So what we're noticing is there's not that separation of church and state like we're familiar with here in the United States, where we would never have um, a religious organization going through and, and uh, doing a, a substitute census type record. So you're these absolutely aren't right. census records, but they become census records when it's an every year thing. Is that what you're telling me? That is. And in fact they even became more formalized as this of the, as the census around eighteen ninety four. In eighteen ninety four that was really the last year that they were testing the knowledge of the catechism. Uh, but still the church was conducting the same census from, from eighteen ninety five on on behalf of the state, but the church was conducting it. So uh, very good. Okay. All right. So let me uh, just dig in here a little bit. The these census books are marvelous. Uh, if you have Swedish family, these you should be just incredibly excited to have these kind of books available. Mm -hmm. You can track your families really through time and space. And I'm going to mm -hmm. geek out a little bit. I say time and space. And, uh, you know, yes, yeah, so yeah. say it, it happens. I'll just go move where on no from man that. has gone before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it happens. It happens. <laughs> so, so the. The great thing is these books were compiled by the parish priests, and it wasn't a new book used every year. These books were used for three or five or ten years, depending on the population of the census. So you mm -hmm. can look in these books, and you can see the growth of each family from year to year to year mm -hmm. to year. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, go ahead. And the concept, I would think, is that um, in a given locality, the parish priest would pretty much know who he'd buried, who he'd married, and who he christened. Do they call it christening in Lutheran records? Uh, in these books, they're referred to as births. Okay. Or, or fod. I, my Swedish is horrible, and please don't okay. put me on that. But, uh, yes, yeah, so we are referring to them as births in these records. So that's a very important distinction between what they're recording is a baptism as opposed to a birth. So we... It's not their birth was not exactly that date. Is that correct? I in in the christening records that would be true, but in these records the birth oh. date should be the ah, birth date. That excellent. Is. Oh, good distinction. So there would be a separate christening record um, at the, made by the parish priest. Wow. That now what have you got this about movings recorded as they happen oh, oh people leaving and going to the next farm or something exactly yeah you're jumping ahead there but that's one of the most exciting things so I've, I've got the note there that says birth marriage death these events so not only did the parish priest go to each house year after year after year and test the people in their knowledge of the catechism mm -hmm. getting that yearly recording they would also make note of any special events that happened throughout the year, whether it be a birth or a marriage or a death, or whether they moved out of the parish, parish or whether they moved into their parish. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll give you more detail on that as we begin to look at some of these records. Uh, and then these records really, I, again, it's, I'm reiterating that the fact you can follow your individuals from 
if you're if you're lucky from 1684, but the records are expended from 1700 through 1945. If you're I was like from... already flipping my wig when it came to 1715 as a strong point of compliance, and then. Uh, I mean, because in England they're happy that it's 1837. That's a you know that's more than a hundred years later. So it's pretty incredible, Jason. No, the Swedes and their record keeping are are almost untouched by any. I'm I'm in awe of these. And just a, a quick note. I mean, so I'm representing my heritage, and and we're we're working with a group called ArchiveDigital.net. And get let me give them a little plug. They have. Uh, as complete a collection as there exists for these records on their site. Yes. They aren't all in name indexed. If you go to archivedigital.net right now, you can see all the images. I believe they're behind a paywall. Yes. But, but they're beautifully uh, recorded images. These aren't from microfilm. They've actually gone in to every uh, archive, every parish where these records existed and photographed and created a new full color version of these records. Full color helps because sometimes you can tell a difference in the ink color, etc. Oh, little absolutely. clues, little clues. So maybe let's let's dive in. I'm going to go to the web page here. Mm -hmm. See if I can figure out how to do this. You can. Oh, you're very encouraging. I appreciate that. I know you can do it. <laughs> so this is my home page on my heritage. Uh, but I'm going to go to the research button here because this is really where we want to dig into the records today. Okay. And we're hiding these under Nordic censuses right now. Okay, could, could Nordic. Yes, zoom in so we can see now. Sure. Nordic. Let me, let me let me go back so I can zoom in on that. So if you go in the top right yes. corner, you see yes. this field Nordic censuses. Okay, it's a now, census replacement again. It's not strictly a census, but it, it effectively is for Sweden. Yes. Now, let me ask you about the word Nordic. Does that include all of what we call the Scandinavian countries, or am I is my thinking skewed on that? No, no, you're correct. It's going to include all the Scandinavian countries as well as Finland, which is not a Scandinavian country. Oh, yeah, that's that tricky one that had so much trouble with their neighbors. They uh, they all seem to have some trouble with each other at some point, mm -hmm, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad they're getting along now. There's some really neat countries there. It is good. I love that part of the world. Okay, so I'm going to zoom out a little bit here, and you can see we've got a few collections in the Nordic censuses right now. Yes. Uh, they are building very quickly this year, but we're going to just dive into the Swedish household records. So now, we, okay. oh, go ahead. So we could have... When if we searched at this point, would we look? E would we be looking in both record groups? But we don't want to do that. We want to look just at Swedish. Correct. Okay, for, there's for today. one million records in there. Yeah, give it about three weeks, and it'll be 53 million records. Oh my heavens! Wow. So, yeah. So right now, it's we only have the the slice of the pie that's 1880 to 1920, and that's that's just right now. Mm. Uh, and of that slice, we have about half of them produced. It took us two, six to eight months to get those ready. The, mm -hmm. the next installment is, is prepared, and we're just getting it onto our site. So 53 millions in about three weeks. Oh, my heavens. This is just phenomenal. Now, these are some beautiful, beautiful records. Yes. Okay. So I, I want to go into my advanced search because I'm going to use a, a, a full date here. I know the guy I'm looking at for the sake of this. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about Anders. Gustav Andersen. Anders, the son of Anders. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit redundant. He's a good guy, though. We like mm -hmm. him. He was born on Valentine's Day. Oh, that was nice. Yeah, it's, it's handy for remembering, too. And he was in 1833. So we're just going to okay. hit enter now to go search that. Okay. Interesting that Andersen has two S's. Uh, if I had by mistake typed with one S, might it still find this gentleman? Yes, but his name would come down farther on the list. We would try and yes. zoom in on what you had said first. Yes. Then you'd have to scroll down through several iterations of the name to get there. All right, so it won't totally lose me if I don't know how to spell it in Swedish. Correct, correct. Okay. So, so I, we're getting some hits right away, and I know that these first books that are showing up are our fellow here. 
but I don't want to start here. You can see this first book is the years 1884 to 94. Mm -hmm. I want to go earlier. Uh, this other one is 95 to 1906. But we're going to start down here, 1870 to 82. Okay. So let's walk through the record that comes up first. So it's telling us, hey, yes, this is your guy. He was born February 14, 1833. Uh, El Garros, I think that's how you say it. Someone's going to correct me. Yeah. Uh, if you hover over this little blue thing, you get the Google map, and it shows you where in the country it was, oh, when it shows up. Well, there's some historical <laughs> villages that just don't show up. Yeah. This other one does show up. This is yes. his residence at the time. Whoa. So you where he was living within uh, within the country. I love that dynamic interactivity there. Oh, it's some neat stuff. Yes. He's married in 74, so remember that. We're going to come back to that in a second. Okay, yeah. 1874 marriage. I'm writing down. Oh, dear, you're going to hold me to this. Yes. So, <laughs> so if you want to do this citation, we're giving you all the information you need here. We, you know, oh. Right down to the page and line number of the book, uh, you get the name of the book. This right here where it says book, Algaros AI4, that is the archival serial that they use. If you if you go to the archive, oh, ask for Algaros sure. AI4, that's that's all you need for that. They know what it is. Yes. So excellent. So I'm going to scroll past the image here for a second. I want to show you what's below the image. Okay. So we're getting into the family. You see Anders Gustav Anderson and then his wife. Carolina. Please scroll down more because I can't see it. I'm only seeing the top half of your... There we go, dear. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's, so you see his wife, Carolina, and you see his wife, Stina. So, you know, oh my. Argue, is this fellow a polygamist? Well, we're going to look at the image here in just a second. You can see he had three daughters and a son here as well. Yes. So uh, one thing to note, because we're going to move away from this page, uh, you can save this record if you want. If this is your guy, you click Save Your Record, you can save it to your tree. We've also got a few things below it. We're saying, hey, if this is your guy, we have these other records that are related to Anders Gustav Anderson, and we're, we're giving you suggestions. These may be your people. We're trying to roll help you with that. Roll your mouse slowly over some of that text so we can see that there's a pop-up that gives us a preview of the information. Yes. Whoa, very cool. Now this is, so let me get this straight. What you're talking about here is you've put the MyHeritage viewer and the MyHeritage search algorithm initially and the MyHeritage viewer around the images from Archiva Digital. Uh, around the around the images that we have indexed for them thus far. Okay, so that's what the concept is of what's it's. I'm not saying it's slowing things down or whatever, but in in other words, instead of having all the images there at once, you're giving us the images as they're indexed. Okay. Correct. Correct. Because Got it. Our whole paradigm, we want to help you put these to your tree. And mm. to do that, you need to know the record information. Right. All right. So we're going to go back up to this image. And I want to dive in on this image just to show you how awesome these records are. Okay. So I'm going to There's zoom the in book. here. There's the book. Whoa. Okay. You see that okay? Yes. And then zoom in here on the area I want. Yes. So we see we have Anders Gustav Anderson. But it's crossed out. Well, we, you're you're jumping ship here. We're gonna we'll get there. We'll get it, there. Oh, it's okay that it's crossed oh, out. Oh, absolutely. That means something later. Okay, that I can is understand. very meaningful. We want to know. It's great observation that he's crossed out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm gonna explain that in a second here. Good. Okay, I'll okay. wait. <laughs> <laughs> so we see the EQ. This identifies him as the head of the home. Okay. Underneath, we see this HU. This is for Husmutter or Huster. Yes. And beside Stina, Jon's daughter. Yes. She's crossed out. So let's talk about her crossing out first. Okay. Stina, Jon's daughter, is crossed out because you see this 74 over here? Yes. So if, if you can see not all the images, you can see into the crease very well, but I'll tell you that column, if you look at the top of it, it says Dod. 
which means died or dead. Death, yes. Oh, so she is crossed heaven. out because yes. she died in 1874. Yes. So let, let's go. Let's backtrack a little bit. 1833 is Anders Gustav Andersen's birthday, yes. February 14th. He was married. Gift means uh, married. U yes. gift would mean single, but he was gift in 1862, okay. December 6th. Yes. So he, he and Stina happily married 1862, but this next column, Engling Eller, means he became widowed on April 14th of oh. 1874. Okay, now wait. While you're while we're looking at those dates, can you zoom in just a tad more? Now, when you said 1833 that he was born February 14th, yes. see how they do the slash there, 14 slash 2, so the 14th day of the second month. And they're using the calendar as we are using it, so 2 means February. Yes. Okay, and so yeah. then on the 62, it's the 6th day of December that he, what was that column? Did he marry Widow. that? That is his marriage. Oh, That's yes, right. Married. Right, and but the next one. Is 74, they're assuming somebody doesn't live 150 years, um, <laughs> that he was um, in, in uh, 1874, the 14th of April. Yes. He married again. Widow. No, he, no, that's he became widowed. single on the 14th widowed. of April. He signal. Sig okay, not divorced. No, no, no. Well, in in some of the later books, that, that could be an implied option, but at this time, okay. corroborating it with this death information that you see on the right-hand side, we know that he became a widower. Mm -hmm. and, and just a point of note, this next column uh, that has the V in it, I'm yes. not going to try and translate that for you or, or say the word. That just means he was vaccinated for uh, polio. Oh, okay. Or Perfect. Polio. Small I think it was oh, smallpox. Yes. I don't think they came up with yes. the vaccine till my lifetime. <laughs> yes, yes. I was getting ahead of myself. Okay, but that is his vaccination. <laughs> you know, I'm just a young kid. What do I know? Oh, I yes, we know medical way. history. We. Li I live in 1874. I remember it well. <laughs> <laughs> you look surprisingly good for your age. Oh, thank you. I love it. Do you see, Cousin Russ, how I pull in those compliments? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> She's okay. very subtle. I love that about the Froyland. <laughs> All right. So, continuing on where he's become a, a widower in 74, but <laughs> luckily the, this marvelous woman over here, uh, Carolina Andersdotter, she, okay. This is the move-in column. She moves in in 1874 from this parish yes. here. So we yes. could actually go to this parish book previous to 74 and find her in that parish as well. So she oh, moves that's in. That's the name of her previous home, her yes, previous yes. parish. This is like I'm saying. You can follow them. Go back and find her, and then you find her parents. Yes. I mean, these are great. I love it. Okay, okay. so. Oh, let me guess something here. Uh, go for it. He was widowed or became single. We know widowed because of the death of that first wife in uh, on April 14th. And it looks like that same year in November, he marries Carolina. Yes, Anders does not stay down. And I'm going to show you how true that is. Mm. In a so yes, he's got a he's got a family. He's got three daughters and a son that need caring for, and mm -hmm. and so Carolina comes in and helps him. And uh, because she's an addition to the family, after the family's starting to be recorded, she doesn't get her own line. She's dropped on the line where the previous wife was. Okay. Okay. So these are living records as far as the priest is concerned. Mm -hmm. So you can see he's got Dot for daughter, mm -hmm. and that's Ditto down, and then the son Alfred. Mm -hmm. So one other note, uh, this is their farm name right here. Oh, this okay. Vestra, I'm not going to try and pronounce Whatever that. the name is, we would just yes. type it or transcribe it as we see, yes. Yes, and, and these individuals down here yes. were people who, in the same farm or same household. They are not necessarily relatives. In fact, because they're not crossed out with these ones, I do not believe they're relatives. They were most likely, 
It actually does not explicitly say because we have another head, another wife, and another son. Oh, okay. On the same farm? Yes, on the same farm. Okay. But it looks like they stayed. And, yeah. and further down the page as well. But let's go back up to this family because we're talking about that. So you were asking about this crossing out stuff. Yes, did they leave the f church? So they did not leave the church. Oh. But let's, let's talk about the church here. So over here on the right, you're seeing in 1870-71, they were Anders and his wife were tested for their knowledge of the catechism. Same oh, okay. as 72, 73, 74, 75, and they are tested in 78, 79. And it's not because they left the church. It's because... Yes, they weren't tested. <laughs> no, they, they, were, they were tested. And oh. they were not tested because this column gives the year that they moved. In 78, they moved. Yes. So, so we they, they moved. married in 1874, and four years later, they moved. They got out of Dodge. Now, they didn't go far. This column right here, the, the, the Til, would give the parish name that they had moved to, but the parish name is absent. Instead, the priest recorded the page of the book that they moved to. Okay. Was it because so, they had a whole bunch more children it wouldn't fit? Or they had better land. You know, I, I wish I had that part of the history. Okay, so we don't know that part. If they emigrated, meaning e-emigrate exit, to another uh, country, would it be the same lines, but they would tell something different here or uh, not? Great question. Often you will see America written oh, here, okay. for example. A, a very, very common there. So yes, the country name would be listed there and not the parish. Okay. Sounds so, like the parish priests were uh, genealogists in disguise. Oh, they, I, they left paper trail for us. They did leave a paper trail, Cousin Russ. Cousin Russ, are we getting any comments from the community yet? Nope. All right, uh, they uh, are wrapped. They are paying attention. You have... Uh, they're paying rapt attention, or they're so, wrapped up in this thing. <laughs> so, so we know that they moved to page 302. So let's go to page 302. So okay. I'm going to go to the bar up here at the top, and I'm just going to scroll down. Just so you understand, this you have two numbers here. You have 70, and you have 62. 70 is the ordinal number, or meaning this is the actual 70th page in the book. Yes. But if you look at the written number on the page, it says page 62. Okay. That's the difference. So we're going to go to page 302. Okay, I'm closing my eyes while you scroll that far. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I love it. I hope you're having fun visiting with us this evening, Jason, because we're learning a lot from you. Oh, dear. Wait, I, you know what? Maybe you could share that with my wife afterwards, let her know that I actually helped someone. <laughs> okay. That would be great. Okay. Okay, so here we are on page 302. All right. So we can see they've moved to a different farm. <gasps> okay. Uh, and let's make sure we've got the right ones. We've got Anna Maria Jan's daughter uh, right here, Anders Gustav Andersen, born. Let me zoom in okay. for you. Okay, yes, thank you. Born 1833 on April 14th in El Garros, so we know this is our guy. Oh, and, okay. And uh, let's see. I want to show you his wife here. Man, this is so readable. Well, the again, you know, I, I I'm in love with the images that Archive Digital provided. They did just a top-notch job. Mm -hmm. um, you know, shameless advertising for them. They did a very oh, good job. Advertise away. We have good friends um, who work there and uh, have known them for years, including Kathy, their North American representative for many years. So. Oh, she's a good lady. Yes, she is. Now, I uh, see Emma is cr slashed as opposed to lined out. Is there a story there? Well, so his second wife, uh, are you talking about right here or, or no, down below? I'm, I'm talking Emma. about Emma, yes. Well, Emma, the daughter, she's, she's slashed. Yes, you're right. She, she is not lined out. She's not dead, and we can confirm that because she does not have death information on her line. Okay. And we can further confirm that because if you go all the way over here to the right side of the page, she's yes. moved to this oh. parish right here. I wonder if she oh. got married. Or, or it was very common 
for uh, unmarried girls as they were getting a little older. So mm -hmm. let's figure out how old she was here. You mean, in fact, old maids? I am not going to use that term. <laughs> but but she I did, will. <laughs> she, 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 I, I've researched her, so I, she did become a maid. Um, oh, okay. So she left. Her She was barely there in 70. Uh, or, I'm sorry, she moved here in 78. She was recorded there, but not in... She was not recorded in 82. So she moved out in 80. You can see the date she moved out over here on the forum. And she moved to this village. She was born in 63, so she was 17 years old. Yeah, it's time. Time for her to get out of the house. Mm -hmm. And if you follow her, she has the title of Piga, P-I-G-A, on her next image. And that, that means maid. Okay, and so would she also, not only became an old unmarried woman known as an old maid of 17, but Piga meant she went into the service um, of a, another household to earn her way in the world. Absolutely, and they frequently did, would do a one-year contract mm -hmm. and then go from household to household, or they may renew, but yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're getting feedback from the community. Congrats, this is... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Anna says, this is great. You definitely have my full attention. Mm -hmm. And the answer to the question earlier uh, of Anna, uh, where did her uh, uh, grandparents immigrate from, uh, into, uh, she says, Manchester, Connecticut. My great-grandfather was a master silk weaver and was recruited by the sw silk mill in Manchester. Wow, very interesting, very interesting. Okay, Jason, let's go back to this book. Well, I, just, I wish I had master silk weavers in my family. They were <laughs> rope makers, nothing terribly exciting. <laughs> you got to right. have a rope to pull in the fish line. <laughs> they were really rope makers in the desert, though, so I'm not sure what they were doing. Okay, I hear you. So, so Anders' second wife, this, this Katarina, Anders' daughter, Yes. Well, she didn't make it either. Oh, she no. She died on September 4th oh. in 1878. Oh. Well, Anders does not stay down. She died on September 4th. This other woman moves in uh, in November, but they're actually married in October of 79. So he's single for about 11 months here. Okay. And then he, he marries, uh, what is it, Christina Olofsdottir. Yes. And uh, one one note, you can start to look at a little bit of the family here. Mm -hmm. So Katarina had this son, Johann Fritz. This mm -hmm. this was their child, uh, and he was born on August 30th in 1878. Oh, no. Five days later, Mom dies. Oh, yes, I was doing the math. Oh, my heavens. Yeah, so you can assume that, yes, you can probably correct. Complications. Yeah, yeah, complications, and she died because of that. Uh, but again, you're, you're seeing the new family coming together. You get their new marriage date. Mm -hmm. You get her new birth information here. Uh, no, she's 15 years younger than Anders. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. But only one year uh, younger than Anders' previous wife. And this was terribly common. The men were often not married until they were established. Mm -hmm. uh, so that they could provide for a family. So it was very common to have a wife 10, 12, 15 years younger than they were. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, can I ask, I want to ask a question. Sure, the, fir the first page, we had two wives of which Katrina was the second wife. Am I remembering that first page correctly? You are right. Okay, so when they came to the new page, when he moved to this new farm, it's only recorded as his, with his second wife, and then she dies, and his third wife then is entered above the second wife's name. Do I have that correct? Absolutely. The second wife was the only one the parish priest was familiar with. Thus, mm -hmm. she was the only one who was recorded there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. And again, that column that's after their um, birth year and birth mo uh, day and month, that is their original parish, their home parish where they were born. Are you talking right here where I'm kind of circling no, with my mouth? No, column right after, see Anders, 1833, then yes. 14, two, then what's that next That's column? his birth parish right birth there. Birth parish, right. That's So you would be able... 
Russ, if you descended from, from this third wife, you would be able to um, follow along because there you can barely make it out. We'd have to zoom way in to see what her parish of record of birth was. Very faint. So one other neat thing here, I, uh, if you look at the second wife's birth parish, yes. I believe so. I believe that's where uh, yeah. Hofa, where where daughter went to. Um, yes, oh. where daughter went to go uh, work. Oh, that's interesting. So there was a bit of a famili familial connection, you know. Yes. Got the you a job. Club. The fan mm -hmm. club. Mm -hmm. So, so one other note. So we're back, we're, we've moved on to page three hundred two. But yes. if you wanted, if you forgot where you started, well, the mm -hmm. parish priest in this new parish, or actually, this was the same parish, but this new farm, he made a note back to the part page where they originally came from. Oh, he cross reference. Yes. This is an ec Oh, I love this parish priest. Oh my. So you know, generally. They did a phenomenal job. Now, there's there's the occasional priest who may have taken a few shortcuts, but generally, from from the experience we've had with these collections thus far, mm -hmm. uh, they've done a marvelous, marvelous job with these. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, so we've, oh, go ahead. We've been looking at this in full screen. What if I want to save a copy of these this page? So, if you want to save a copy of the page, we go up to the top right here. Mm -hmm. And you can download that document. Okay, so that's where the down. I can't see your mouse pointer. Oh, okay. yeah, I got it. I there see it, it is. Okay, yeah. download the document. The other right. one would be print, and that would be pretty hard because this is a double page <laughs> spread. It would be rather hard. small. Yes. So, yes, it would. So, it, not, uh, some other great things. If I'm going to exit this full screen mode, yes. uh, just to make a note. So, I'm back out here and I'm looking at the page. I, yes. can, I can save that record back out again. That will create a link from, from the record sourcing the image mm -hmm. at, to your family tree. Excellent. Uh, and in, in we Mark. can put our family trees up there, up on my heritage, a number of different ways, though, can't we? Let me see if I can enumerate them. We could use Family Tree Builder, which coordinates directly with my heritage. And it's a My Heritage project, is that correct? Correct. And that the Family Tree Builder is software that exists on your PC, and then does it just immediately sync as soon as you save to add a new person? You have the option to turn that on or off, but yes. Okay. Another way that you can get your uh, family tree up on um, myheritage.com is the way that I know my very distant cousin, Dear Myrtle, did it. She used a genealogy program long before Family Tree Builder was around. She made a GEDCOM file and uploaded it once she created her account at MyHeritage. Isn't it also possible to type in each person individually? To tie in each per I'm sorry. Type. No, type. To type. Well, you can create a tree from scratch, yeah. absolutely. Uh, oh, in fact, I goodness. just to show you, I manage my own trees, and I've started doing some of that. Mm -hmm. So my dad's son's family tree, I mean, it's a mm -hmm. bit generic. This is my one that my mom's been working on forever. And she, you know, there's, there's some work there. Mm -hmm. But I've been doing some testing and playing with this older family tree. Mm -hmm. and there's only 20 people in there because I've been doing exactly what you just said. I've been typing them in and, and, and kind of doing this experience on my own as well. I want to see how it works and get the full out of it. So yes, you're absolutely right. There are a few ways to load some trees up. Okay. I would say, folks, though, in Freudlein Smith's opinion, the best thing to do is to keep, not that we don't trust my heritage to uh, keep our tree in good order, but I would like to see you have the data on your computer and think of my heritage as not only your full view backup of it, of your genealogy data, but a premier search engine to help you find documents that happen to be part of the collection either natively at my heritage or through partnerships 
such as this one with Archive Digital. Absolutely, and there and there's several ways of getting your records on those trees. And mm -hmm. so we showed you, you know, we went to research, and we went to search all the records, mm -hmm. and we went to Nordic. So we're getting down to very specific record collection searches. Mm -hmm. That that's one way to do it. It's kind of a traditional way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah. On that image that we just saw a few minutes ago with all the names, if I only have the gentleman, the head of household, for lack of a better word, if I have him in my tree and that record gives me the three daughters and the son, when I accept that record, do they get added to my tree? Yes, as daughters and son. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. what about the new wife? You would have to go to the next record for her. Right now, uh, well, let's go back to Anders again, just yeah. so I don't have to have you use your imagination to discover what I'm talking because about. Because we're not very imaginative, imaginative around here. Let's see, how do you say that word in English, Cousin Russ, imaginative? Uh, yeah, something like that. That's a wacky way to say it. <laughs> oh, it's Wednesday, so what else? Yes, okay, so we're looking at your screen again. Yes, and I neglected to type in the, the birth information, so I'm just going to edit my search here because I want to get a little more specific. Again, yes. he's born on Valentine's Day, February 14th in 1833. So let's go to Anders. And we were looking at the fourth record down. You know, yes. and we could, we, if we wanted, we could spend time, if we went to this record right here, Yes. This is just the sec that second page that yes. we were looking at because we see it's the same book. It's Algoros AI4. You can't see me pointing at my screen, but I'm pointing at my screen right now, and it's right. <laughs> it's <laughs> not working, is it? <laughs> I can see it. Yes. We have magical powers on Wacky Wednesday for one hour. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go into Anders right here, and we're going to go down. So if we were to import this record right now, what we would get is everything you see. Can you see my screen where it's listing all yes. of the individuals? Yes. This is what you'll get. You'll keep all those familial relationships, and you'll get them with two wives. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yep, I see it. And uh, you okay. know, then you'll have to, right now, all you're going to import is the birth information. But if we were to go to, uh, I think it was Stina who died. If we go to Stina... Yes. And we're going to get her birth, her death year here, and we will get more there specific information. Right. Okay. You want to? Did you just show me something else? Well, yeah, I let's ask a few questions. Well, let me show you one other thing. Just as far as sure, we're talking I love about those good thing. pictures. Oh, you know what? They're it's a good thing they take after their mother. Um, <laughs> They're beautiful. Oh, you're very <laughs> kind. Thank you, Fräulein. Um, so we've got the record matches here. The, these two things, smart matches and record matches, are, are kind of the bread and butter of the MyHeritage site. And it's, it's, we've got some beautiful technology here that does some great searching yes, for you. you. So, so these record matches, if you click on that, right now it says I have 7,903 record matches waiting for me to evaluate. And this is our system going... Okay. Yeah. Yes, it's, you're never going to get all <laughs> Too much information, as it were. So it's oh, right now. No, look, it's wonderful. In this England birth and christening collection, I have it, the program is saying, you know what? We have 237 matches that we believe are yours. Yes. Um, and it, so I've worked with with quite a few organizations, and and I, I got to safely say, and I've kind of been taken to task on this because I was skeptical at first. Our, our search is marvelous. Uh, well, I can I know that because dear Myrtle told me before she left that she actually was doing research and she does it down at the um well she likes shaky leaves and and record matches and little suggestions but she was able to find things on family search using my heritage that she could not find using the search algorithm at Family Search. She's yeah, it, it, a serious it, 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 researcher, <laughs> and so that is. So you got a couple of people saying you have a darn good search algorithm at My Heritage. Yeah, it's very focused. Uh, if I'm telling you you have a match, you know, I don't. I don't want to throw a statistic to it, but my own heuristic is about nine times out of ten. 
the match is my person. It's it's not a very broad scattershot. So this is one way of finding people. You can go to our record matching. The other way is we, you can go to smart matches, and this is a little different. I actually have well, there's I have about eight thousand record re, record matches to review or smart matches to review. And let's just go look at that, and I'll show you what that is very quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, what this is, it's more connecting tree to tree rather than record to tree. So I'm yeah. seeing that these people have 36 commonalities to my tree. I could go to them. I could compare trees, get more information from them. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, admittedly, trees are only as good as the information that's put in. I mean, some of the best, worst errors are perpetuated throughout family trees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But people who do a good job with them, you can get the source information. You can get great hints on where to look. Mm -hmm. So we, we do some marvelous uh, linking of trees to, to allow you to build your own trees, kind of collaborating so, with others. Yeah, my genie.com tree and my heritage tree find each other frequently. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how that works. Well, but then you know what, Cousin Roz? That would be your own excellent research coming back to haunt you. <laughs> yeah, it does. But the, re the, the record matches, you're, you're correct, they are incredible. I've seen newspaper. In fact, I was looking at some this afternoon that came in my record matches today, and they're incredible. Incredibly high uh, accuracy. Something I'd like to say, um, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, our focus tonight was Swedish Lutheran records at my heritage, and these were called the household examination books, which became a de facto census enumeration since the parish priest went to every household. Now, not every researcher likes to go down drilling down to look at a specific record group. And this is one of the good things about my heritage. Um, our good friend here, um, Jason, I had to look at his name because dear Myrtle didn't actually officially introduce <laughs> us, did, he, did she? She leaves, okay. she leaves so quickly on Wednesday evenings. I could rob her blind while she's gone, but anyway, <laughs> I digress. Other people like to search by name and they want to find another tree to collaborate with another researcher. Um, uh, some people like to work just by record group, and Cousin Russ has done a series of, uh, uh, with Dear Myrtle, of two presentations as to why search by just one record group, because you get really good at citing it and only have to change page numbers and name a person. Uh, and um, the other one is um, how to integrate that one single record group research, uh, such as Swedish Lutheran records. Another thing that I'd like to mention in, in I'm uh, preaching to the choir here, Jason, but your my heritage is uniquely poised to deal with multiple language issues. And I don't want to say issues. It's more than just that the drop-down menus change to a different language. Aren't there something like 40 languages represented at, represented at my heritage? That's exactly right, and, and growing. I, that was another thing that was really exciting to me to come over to my heritage from, mm -hmm. from some of the other organizations. Mm -hmm. um, not only can you search from within your native language, but we'll also do a lot of translation on, on names. You know, if, yes. if you're looking up Johan, then it will also search as John or, or you know, whatever other language. Mm -hmm. Michel might be Michael. Uh, mm -hmm. There's some great transliteration in names as well. Mm -hmm. so you're absolutely right. Um, you know. That transliteration is not something we see at other um, ge genealogy websites per se. Um, certainly not on such a high-profile website. This is one of the top four that I refer to um, and that I keep pushing Dear Myrtle to look into, and that's why I'm so glad she had you come visit this evening. <laughs> you wanted I'm to show us something on your screen before well, we go? Yeah, I mean, just let me give you a little background on why we're so focused on all these other languages. So I'm just pulling up, you know, if you want to see where our members are. Let's just look at Europe and see why we have to cater to this kind of interest. I mean, 
Mm -hmm. uh, where's, where's Turkey? I mean, Ukraine, we have 300,000 members submitting trees and, and working with us that we need to cater to. I wow. mean, UK, three and a half million. But you get some really interesting dynamics going here when you have this worldwide organization of people bringing their own interest levels in. You, you mm -hmm. have to. You can't, you can't stay to just English anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, are these the instant match people, or are these the... Um these are your tried and true members. The, these are members who have submitted trees on some level, so you would find results coming from these people coming through in the smart matches. Okay, got it. Wow. And, yes. I have, a, I have a question. I don't speak Swedish, but I am guessing that what I would need to learn in that record collection that you shared with us tonight, all I would need to know is what's in those columns and understand that language of what those columns stand for and pick out the ones that I want to look at and not have to worry about the language. I might have to le learn more about the writing of the, the priest, but uh, I would not have to learn birth, death, marriage, but what the columns really mean. Is that fair to say? You know what? You can even make it more simply. I mean, if you remember that fod is, is birth, dod is death, mm -hmm. gift yep, yep. is marriage, you know, you've, you've got your vital information there. Yep. Well, and I should say, Cousin Russ, I know that you and dear Myrtle like to pr uh, preach, I was going to say. You, <laughs> you tell your folks to look at Family Search Wiki for suggestions and the Swedish wiki entry at familysearch.org gives you some language hints there of those basic vocabulary words. So that's a resource that can be available to you to use hand in hand with what's across the top. There's also Google Translate. Oh, can I tell you how much I used Google Translate on some of these articles? <laughs> Absolutely. My, my, you know, give it to me in French, give it to me in a couple other languages, and I'm okay. Swedish was not a strong suit. All right, we have a question from the community for you about joining my heritage. Russ? Nadine says, with my heritage, is the whole world included in the membership, or do we have to get another membership for the world? So let me kind of give you the high level on, on how the memberships work. There's there's essentially two kind of paths. You can go in and get everything but the data, which means you know if you want to research collection specific stuff, that yes. might be a separate package. But if you want all the tree look, if you want all the smart matching, if you want all the uh, the record matching, that's one package. Or mm -hmm. there's just this data package, or there's all three. Or is it the size oh. of your tree another? Uh, Parameter. Oh, now you're going to get down in the weeds, but yes. <laughs> okay. Yes is the great answer. <laughs> I, I looked. I mean, I, I have my heritage, but that was one of the things because I had a pretty good sized tree that I put up, and I realized that I had to go, and that's where I learned that there was different sizes based on the number of individuals in your tree. So you, I think you have a great variety of packages that we can sign up for, not one buys all, you know, buy everything, or uh, mm -hmm. you, you can grow, grow the size of your subscription, I believe. Okay. No, absolutely, and we've tried to cater to not just the beginner, I mean, it, really, we've, we've got a marvelous thing where you can go to someone on the street, and you have them type in their name, their parents, their grandparents, and, and minutes later, we're showing them it's an awful lot of information instantly. But we also try to, we want to cater to you, Myrtle. That's why we have all these, these records on the research. I'm not Myrtle. Model. I know I look I'm like her. Um, Schmidt, yes. I apologize. I know I look like, like her, but she does a much better job in the hairstyle department. Oh, you're both <laughs> handsome women. <laughs> and, and it has a comment here. There is okay. a Swedish American genealogy group on Facebook that is very, very, helpful with translation. I okay. am making a note on that, Anna. Thank you. Okay, this is how we rock and roll around here, Jason. We get a lot accomplished by zeroing in on just one concept. 
in this short hour and do you see how we're getting help from the community as well as giving help to specific researchers out there who are getting into their Swedish ancestry. Oh, I love it. I hope I can come back sometime. You can come back any old time. Uh, you want to unscreen share for a minute so we can see you? Yeah. Oh, really? You want to do that to yourself again? Sure. Yes, yes, Let's sure. see if I can figure out how to do that. Ross. Just unscreen, unscreen share. Yeah, I think he's coming there back. There you go. There, there you he go. is. So excellent job. Um, and I'll write a note for your wife if necessary. <laughs> so I hope she has dinner for you, dear. Okay. Oh, um, thank you, Fräulein. I guess there's probably not a whole lot much more to say, Cousin Russ. Have we handled all the comments from the community? Uh, we have, actually. Okay, that's good. All right, well, then, on behalf of Cousin Russ, I'm Dear Myrtle's very distant cousin with the sweet-sounding voice. Hers is so gravelly and low, I don't know how you tolerate it. But I'm Fräulein Schmidt, and uh, happy family tree climbing, everybody. That's a wrap. <laughs>